Hey, good morning, church. Today, we're going to begin what I believe is one of the most important sermon series that we've done in a long time. We're going to look at the book of Daniel and learn some truth about how to stand firm in our faith in a culture of compromise. We live in a culture that's rapidly moving away from God. And let's face it, truth has been abandoned and secularism embraced. Tolerance used to mean that we could disagree and I would tolerate your opinion and you would tolerate mine. We could agree to disagree, but today tolerance means that I must embrace your beliefs, even if I consider them to be immoral or sinful. Otherwise, I'm intolerant. There are things that have played into this, like the breakdown of the traditional family, many institutions of higher learning that have totally rejected moral absolutes, and the and an entertainment industry that promotes all things worldly are helping to move us away from God. And the result is we have a nation that's turned her back on God. Let me tell you, a nation that was once blessed by God that turns its back on God, God is going to bring his discipline. And that's what we see in the book of Daniel. Israel has turned to idols and away from God. And God has sent prophet after prophet to warn them as a nation, and yet they continue to live as if God doesn't even exist. God's patience eventually wears out, and he sends the Babylonians to capture Israel. They burn the city and take many Israelites back to Babylon to live as slaves. And that's where Daniel is. He's one of the slaves. And what this book is about is how Daniel was able to stand firm for God in a culture that was ungodly. Not only did Daniel survive, but he actually thrived and became an influencer for God in a pagan land. So as we walk through the book of Daniel, it's going to give us great instructions on how to live today in a culture that's quickly and rapidly moving away from God and how we can stand firm for God. Good morning. My name is Marcio. I'm one of the teaching pastors here. Excited. Uh, to be a part of this service. Glad to see your faces. And, and we're going to be doing this more often in a more regular uh, way so that we all could talk together. We all get to meet each other. And Chuck gets to see the other services. I get to see the services. And we stay more united as a church. And one of the things I get to say, and I love saying this, and I truly mean it, and our staff really means it, is that after this service, we hope that every single one of you will leave here more empowered more encouraged by your relationship with Jesus. We really, really, really mean that. Especially in the topic that we're talking about today and, 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 and talking about how to stand firm in a culture of compromise. And the thing about culture that we need to understand is that culture is just a way of life, isn't it? It's a way of life. It's how you do things. And there's, in, in, in culture, there is this large scope or society and world, and then there's these cultures also that we have within our own family structure that you have in your family that's different than somebody else's. And here's the thing you need to know, which is the core idea for this morning, is that culture influences decisions. Culture influences decisions. For instance, let me tell you something that happened with me growing up, okay? So, uh, how many of you know what this is? It's a bottle of cologne. Some of you have this, okay? It's Ralph Lauren Polo from 1978. This thing is still in circulation four decades later. How many of you have seen this in your dad's or grandfather's, like, sink cologne area? Raise your hand. How many of you have seen this? Yeah, you've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. I get... Listen, I get this cologne bottle twice a year. My mom buys it for me, Christmas and birthday. So I have a lot of these. Now, why is this interesting in the area of decision and culture? Because I grew up watching my uncle put this on for dates, for business meetings, for everything. And since I didn't have a dad in, in, in my home, the culture that I had learned how to be a man was my uncle, who was like the Brazilian Tom Selleck. He, that's what he was. And he would put this on him and he'd go out and do his things. And so I've brought this into my life and my kids will know this smell till the day they die. So that, 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 that is a smaller segment of you do things your way. There's a culture you have in your home and that influences your decision and decision of your uh, family members. And then there's the, the larger scale, like a society. Uh, you know what this is? Coconut oil. Coconut oil. Now, this is a huge tub, so you know I got it from Sam's Club, okay? And, and, or Costco. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. In 2015, 
the people that were influencers in culture said that you got to buy coconut oil because it's a superfood. So people bought it, including myself, right? You bought this tub and you used it for cooking. You put it in your coffee. You just used it for everything. Then in 2017, somebody else came in and another, different influencers came in with the culture and said, you know what? This is actually pure poison. Don't buy this anymore. It's killing your cholesterol. It's doing all this stuff. And you know what happened to the sales? of coconut oil, just destroyed. Now, some of you still have your tub and you're wondering, what do I do with this? I used to, do, I used to use it, but then I heard it and, and you got influenced to not use it again. You know what my wife uses this for? Remove eye makeup. So there you go. That's what that, we bought this huge thing to remove eye makeup. You see how that works? See, culture influences decisions. It does. And what, what we want you to leave here empowered knowing is that Jesus has strengthened you, has empowered each and every one of you to be a thermostat and set the temperature and be an influencer in culture and not a thermometer where you just sit there and you let someone change you. And you let someone decide for you who you serve and what you do with your life. Speak into you and the purpose that, that you think you might have or you don't even know you have or whatever the case is versus God saying, hey, let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you the purpose I have for you. Let me, let me make you an influencer. Let me make you a thermostat. And in doing this, we don't want to be the Christian community that bashes people all the time. We don't want to be known for that. We don't want to be known for being those kind of curmudgeon Christians. But we want to be this kind of Christian that's an influencer, that's a thermostat. Because you need to understand this, that culture has an agenda for your life. Culture has an agenda for your life. It's going to come up here in a second. It has an agenda. And you need to, you need to see this, that there's, that there's a driving force behind what our, our society's culture and our world culture and it's trying to influence you and away from God. It's trying to pull you away from God. Because God is saying, hey, listen, my son Jesus is going to give you power and an identity. And he's going to fill you with this grace, fill you with this truth, give you purpose beyond your wildest imagination. Now, you got to stay with me. And at the, at the same time, you got this culture. you got culture and society and the world around us telling us, hey, you don't need God. Don't listen to him. He doesn't know what's good for you. And see, this, is, this isn't new. It wasn't like this, 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 all this stuff that we're talking about culture is new. It's, it's been happening since humanity's been around. And we're actually going to see 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, writes to the Christians in this place called Corinth about this very same issue. And in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Apostle Paul says, the God of this age, who, who, this is Satan. He's talking about Satan. Because if, if you believe in God, you got to believe in the enemy. Like, the, he's, he's real. He's not just someone you see on Halloween. And he's subtle. He's clever. He's going to use culture to influence our decisions. And he does this by, by, and he, by, by blinding the minds of people, of unbelievers, to keep them from seeing Jesus, from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. See, the God of this age, Satan, wants to use culture to blind your minds. Now, keep this up just for a second, please. Blind the, you know, blind the minds. Usually when you think of blinding something, think of the eyes. But it's interesting, he said mind. And, it's, and, and when you look into this more, it means makes your mind cloudy. Blind means cloudy. And what, and what, what the, the, Satan wants to do with the culture by influencing you is that when he clouds your mind, he still wants you to see. And he wants to deceive you to think that your decisions are better than if you were to choose God. And that's scary. And, and, and he wants to cloud your mind so that you could see that the decisions you're making for your life are, would be better, are better, that if you were to say, no, I'm going to choose in God, because you start feeling good and you, start, and you start seeing all these things that you think are better for you, but they're really not. And he does that by blinding the mind, and it's very subtle. 
So when we're going to go to Daniel in just a minute, the story of Daniel is, like, like Chuck said, our lead pastor, is the Babylonian people led by King Nebuchadnezzar, and for short, for the rest of the sermon, I'm going to call him King Nebi for my sake, okay? And fun fact, Nebuchadnezzar was the ship in the Matrix, in case you're curious. So King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, takes the Israelites, and instead of just wiping out the people, what they do, they do a cultural genocide cultural genocides, remove all the Israelites, disperse them, bring them into Babylon, teach them the Babylonian culture, send them out to preach the message of Babylon. And the first thing they try to do is this, is culture is going to try to change your identity. Culture wants to change your identity. It's exactly what they want to do, exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar did to Daniel. And here, here it is in Daniel 1, 7. This is how it happened. He gave, the guy here, he is the chief of staff of King Nebi, the chief of staff. His main guy said, gave the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Now, you're probably thinking, what's the big deal, Marcio? They're just names. It's like Robert to Bob, William to Bill, James to Jimmy, Henry to Hank, right? I mean, what's the big deal of changing some names? This was so psychological and so, so evil that he wanted to change their identity by changing their names. Think about what this did. All of these guys' names, <coughs> the original names meant they had a direct connection with their relationship with God, their reverence to God, their love for God, and their understanding of God. And because of the changed names, now these names are actually against God are calling God a monster, saying that God, you know, I don't worship this God, and I actually worship the gods of Babylon and the king of Babylon, and all their names were standing against everything they believed, everything that they thought they were. And you can imagine when they were signing documents, how this would mess with their heads when they had this, when you just naturally signed Daniel. I was like, oh no, I can't sign, I gotta sign Balthazar. It was messing with their head. It was subtle things like this that began to change their identity was beginning to change who they were. And if you change who you are, you begin to change how you live. And you need to know this, that when culture shifts, we must know who we are. When culture shifts, we must know who we are. The Apostle Paul writes in to a group of Christians in this place called Philippi, and that's why we have Philippians 1 right here, 27, 28. The apostle Paul writes this to Christians there. He says, as Christians, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I, whether I come and see you or, or I'm absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. And all of this you're able to stand for because you know who you are, that you are a citizen of heaven. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you are now a citizen of heaven. You have a passport that says heaven. You're written in the book of life, and that's your identity, and that's where you get life from, and you're able to live a worthy life because you know where you're going, and you know who you are. It's in your identity that you're able to stand firm and be a thermostat, an influencer, the way that God made you to be. Now, how many of you have seen the movie Hook? Anybody seen the movie Hook, right, with Dustin Hoffman, Robin Williams? And the premise is that Peter Pan forgets who he is. He actually, he has a whole name change. He's Peter Ban. He becomes a lawyer, becomes an adult. He grows up and has two kids. And Hook comes and kidnaps his kids. And then Peter is now faced at the moment to go and rescue his kids. And what happens? He fails miserably his first attempt. Because he's trying to rescue his kids with his, own, his new identity as Peter banned the lawyer. And he fails to fulfill his purpose with his false identity. It won't work. And then he goes off to Neverland to prepare himself to become Peter Pan, and he's wondering, how can I ever be my true self? And he's just completely defeated on the floor, and the lost boys 
who used to be his posse were wondering how can we how, how can we ever go defeat Hook? Who can this guy really be Peter Pan? And then what happens is this little guy named Pockets. He comes out and he looks at Peter Pan, gently puts his hands on his face. You remember this? Kind of messing with his face and tries to make him smile. Then he says these profound words. He says, oh, there you are, Peter. In a very gentle voice, and that's where everything changes. Because Peter saw his true identity. For the first time, Peter was like, oh, Peter Pan. Everybody else sees it. And see, some of you have forgotten your identity and you've been doing things and living in such a way that you don't recognize who you are anymore. You used to be more loving. You used to be more patient. You used to reflect Jesus. And now you're somebody else and you don't know who you are. And maybe this morning, I am telling you, is the day that you allow Jesus to just gently put his hand on your face and look at you and say, oh, there you are. There you are. You're supposed to be kind and Loving, peaceful, joyful, generous. Oh, there you are. Remember, I, 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 you're loved, you're valued, you're precious, you're forgiven. There you are. Allow Jesus to speak that kind of truth to you this morning. Because once he establishes your identity, you're able to stand firm knowing who you are that you're a child of Jesus, that you're a citizen of heaven. You walk with a kind of confidence knowing that. That, won't, that you don't allow culture to sway you. And you need to know this, that culture wants you to compromise your convictions because if they can mess with your identity, then they're going to have you compromise your convictions. And when this happens, you got to understand this, that cult, when culture shifts, when culture shifts, we must affirm our convictions. We must stand firm in our convictions because our convictions are really, uh, uh, they're an outflow. They, they are a reflection. I don't care what you want to say, but they're, a, they're like one and the same with our identity. With our identity. And what ended up, with, and what was happening with Daniel is that they came into a moment of crisis because they brought Daniel up into the king's court. And now they get to eat from the king's kitchen. That's like Ruth's Chris, you know? T-bones, fillets, you know, all the amazing desserts, the chocolate cakes, the cheesecakes. I mean, you got, you name it, you wanted, you had it. But the problem was that Daniel looked at all of that and said, you know what, here's a problem. My identity, even though you call me Balthazar, I'm really Daniel. My, my name means to, that God's my judge, that I honor God, and God is the ultimate supreme person in my life. And every bit of your food violates my dietary practices, and my dietary practices are directly connected to my relationship with God and my practices of worshiping God. So I can't do this. He stood up to it. And this is what it says in Daniel 1.8. It says this. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. Now, here's what you need to know. Right after that, it says this, that Daniel asked for permission to try a plan with the chief of staff. It's like, hey, I got a plan. You need to understand that when, 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 when you're in this moment and you stand up, God's going to give you some creativity. God's going to give you some discernment. And how you honor those around you, God would bless. Because honoring displays humility. And what does God say about humility? God gives grace to the humble. God honors the humble. God will show favor to the humble. And the Bible says that Daniel earned favor with the chief of staff because he was able to stand with his convictions. Stand. And some of you, you forgot how to stand. And it's subtle, guys. Listen, it's subtle. And I've seen it. I've seen the guy or girl who has all these, who who's, has these firm convictions of integrity 
come into a, 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 a new job and a new opportunity and suddenly, little by little, it becomes money over people. It was small decisions they made in the beginning of their life that was all about money over people. And then when they get success and they move up the chain and they become successful businessmen and businesswomen, but their whole soul is damaged and wrecked and they don't know who they are and they get angry at God. And when they look in the mirror, they don't know the reflection of the person that they're seeing. What ends up happening is that if you were to peel back the tape and look at it in segments, it was a small decision here. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's in debt, over $10,000 in credit card debt. And it happened with a small choice back here. And along the way, she was blinded with each and every purchase. To the point she realized one day when she woke up at 2 in the morning, I'm over $10,000 in debt. What am I going to do? It happens that way with, with moral conviction, right? The, the guy or girl who's tired of being single, and if you're single here, wait, 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 wait. I don't care how old you are. You could be 25, 35, 45. Wait. Don't, don't. Lax, don't go lax, don't get relaxed, don't get lazy on your purity. Because what ends up happening is, man, you know, oh, I'm just gonna date this person. Oh, it's just fine, it's just a little date. Oh, it's just food. Suddenly the date becomes now longer dating and then becomes into months, and then suddenly I'm just gonna spend the night because I'm too tired to drive home. We've just watched Netflix. No, we've watched like eight seasons of some show. Oh, you know, no, 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 you know, we're just gonna spend the night in, in, in the bedroom, but we're not gonna have sex because we're Christians. And then you end up sleeping together, and then all this stuff begins to happen. Then later, you're not fulfilled in this relationship, and it's becoming evident that you don't even know who you are anymore. And you go back. It was a small decision you made here. And in that moment, when you're wrecked and you're damaged and you don't know who you are, please allow Jesus to gently grab your face and say, oh, there you are. Here was this person that fought for purity. Here was that person here that understand generosity. Here, here's this person who loved me. There you are. Come on, I want to I empower you to be a thermostat, to set the temperature, not, be follow, not just follow along with whatever the temperature says, to be a thermometer. You're not that. I'm, I created you to be an influencer in culture. And when you begin to stand and you begin to stand for your convictions and culture that's shifting you, that's trying to shift you, you got to understand that there will be a fight. And you need to know this, that culture will create a confrontation. Culture will create a confrontation. It's going to happen. There will be a fight. How many of you have had battles in your home with a thermostat? Who changed it? Who changed it? Who changed it? You know, it's like you stay, like there's a battle between 78 and 74. It's those small degrees right there. Man, battles, battles are made. Why'd you change it? Who put the lock? Why'd you put the lock? Don't you trust me? And it begins a huge argument in the home about trust because of four degrees, 78 to 74. It's interesting how this happens, right? And the confrontation for Daniel was like this. Look at it in Daniel 1. Look at it in Daniel 1, 12 and 13. So Daniel looked at the chief of staff guy and says, hey, man, listen. God gave him some ideas, but he had to challenge. Daniel had to step up, and he did it in an honoring way. And we're going to talk a lot about that in a second. He did it in an honoring way. He did it in an honoring way, and he said, please, look at the word please. Shows honor, respect. Here, the plan was, hey, test your servants, Okay. For 10 days, and then let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food, and deal with your servants based on what you see. So God gave Daniel favor and creativity when he needed to stand up for his culture, for the culture of Jesus, for the ways of Jesus, for the ways of God, for his heart, for his identity to be secure in his Savior. To be secure in the Savior. And when he, he, he do, you, do you think this was easy? Sitting here, eating a cucumber, not even caught up. <laughs> Over here watching these guys eating cheesecake dessert before dinner. Cutting the T-bone and it's still steaming. Oh, would you like some bacon? 
Oh, sorry, can't. Oh, my bad. Pa, 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 pa. These guys teasing them, saying, hey, look, we got some Don P, some Napa Valley, some of the good stuff. Daniel's like, no, we're good, man. No, no we're good. But by the way, you guys don't have, you don't have any Manischewitz, so we're fine. I'll just have water, you know? Did his thing. It's good, it's good. Ten days later, ten days later, God honored Daniel. And listen to me. God will honor you when you stand, but it will be a sacrifice. It will be hard, and you might lose here on earth, but you will gain because you will gain where it matters most as a citizen of heaven. But in here, you're going to become and reflect Christ because Paul says in your suffering, you will learn about God's glory. You will share in Christ's suffering, and you'll also share in his glory. And in those moments, God's going to make you a thermostat not a thermometer. You have to know this, that when culture shifts, we must respond the right way. God has made you a thermostat for a reason. He empowered you with his Holy Spirit, with the fruit of the Spirit inside of you to be a thermostat, to set the temperature, to be an influencer in your culture. But you've got to respond the right way. And this is how you do it. You do it with grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. I need everybody 100% participation. Please say with me. Grace and truth. One more time. Grace and truth. Now, John, a good friend of Jesus, wrote in John chapter 1 here. He wrote in John 1, 14. Jesus was a good, John was a good friend of Jesus, and he wrote this. The word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, lived with us. We observed, that's so great, that he saw, he saw firsthand Jesus' glory. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father. Full, not partly, not some full of grace and truth. And did you know that God wants to impart in you? The minute, listen, the minute you said yes to him, he made you with the capability of being a thermostat, full of grace and truth. You don't have some. He gives you all of it the moment you say yes to him. The moment you say yes to him, he gives you grace and truth. Now, here's the deal you need to know. When we're as Christians and we're faced with the moment of having to make a decision on our convictions and stand firm with our faith, we got to be truthful, but here's the problem. Truth without grace is just flat out mean. And some of you, and can I just say, can I confess and apologize to anybody who's not a Christ follower here that I've, I've done this too. I've been mean. I've been mean. And in my truth, yeah, I was correct in my truth, but I was wrong in my delivery. And you know what the thing is about being a truth teller? You could set the thermostat how you want, but when you look around, there's nobody with you. No one wants to be in your uncomfortable room. And as Christ followers, we really need to understand how truth is important, and there has to be a connection before correction. You should probably write that down. And I didn't get it. I didn't come up with that. That was another group pastor named Chris Hodges. I just stole it straight from him. There needs to be a connection before correction. You need to have truth and, and know the person before you go ahead and start giving your right thoughts. Because see, you need to balance truth and grace. But here's the problem with grace. Grace without truth is meaningless. So if you think, well, no, I need to be more great, all grace, all grace without truth, it's just meaningless. It's like that parent that says, no, what, kid? Eat whatever you want. Watch whatever you want. Do whatever you want because I love you. It's all about, it's okay. We've all seen those kids. You know who they are. You don't want your kids hanging around with those kids. And it's like being in a room where everybody touches the thermostat. Eventually, people leave because there's no truth there. And so our job as Christ followers, we are given the the ability and empowered by the Holy Spirit to be full of truth and full of grace. And can we put those two statements up together, please? Thank you. 
We have the ability to be full of truth and true, full of grace so that we could be meaningful, so we could have purpose, so we could look at somebody and truly display tolerance and say to somebody, I don't agree with what you're doing, but hey, you know what? I'm going to walk with you. And when you fall, I'll be there to pick you up. And I really want you to succeed. I want you to do well in life. But I don't have to agree with what you're doing. But I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to have lunch with you. And I'm going to spend time with you. And you know what happens? Grace shows that person the power that you have to stay in, in your conviction full of truth. Because you're like, look, you could still have truth and stand your ground and believe in Jesus and in the truth of Jesus and still love other people. And still influence other people. And you know as well as I do, we do not enjoy the movies where cowards are the, are the prominent figures. We don't watch those movies. And you know what? Those movies don't exist. The best movies are the heroes that display truth, their conviction. And they were willing to walk with the people that they are saving with grace. Acknowledging their differences, acknowledging that they don't know, acknowledging that they're blind, and allowing grace for that. And let me tell you what. Jesus has made every single one of you a thermostat. The moment you said yes to him, he's given you all the grace you need and all the truth you need to go be an influencer in this culture so that people can believe in him, belong to him, become like him, and live beyond themselves like him. Amen? Amen. Here's what I want to do right now. I know some of you, um, this is cool that this afternoon we're having a baptism, and we're going to see a lot of people stand for their faith and stand for their conviction, knowing that their identity is in Christ, and we're going to celebrate that. That's going to be amazing. Now, there's some of you in this room that you don't know your identity. It's been lost along the way. And I just want to pray for you. And, and may this morning be the time that you feel, the, feel Jesus grab you and say, oh, there you are. There you are. And then if you feel the, the, the calling and say, you know what? I want to stand up for my conviction. I want to be baptized. We have pastors here. We have people here. Anybody with the little name tag here, you talk to them and say, I want to be baptized. Well, you know what? Go ahead and stand with us knowing your true identity as a citizen of heaven, as a thermostat, as an influencer in this culture. So I'm gonna pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, there are some people here who don't know their identity, who don't know you. And I pray that in the name of Jesus, they would, refer to just right now, they're remembering what Russ said. And man, their sin separated them from God. And here's Jesus at just the right time. He demonstrated his love for us while we were sinners. Truth. Man, we're doomed. Truth. We're in trouble. Grace. Jesus rescues us. Grace. Jesus loves us. Grace. Jesus gives us purpose. Grace. Jesus empowers us. Grace. We don't deserve it. And in this moment, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, I just pray you say these words. Jesus, forgive me. Thank you for the truth that you love me. Thank you for the truth that you saved me. Thank you for the grace that you empower me with. And I want to give my life to you. Amen. If you made that decision, please go tell somebody today. So guys, we're done. Have a great Sunday. And remember, go be influencers. Go be thermostats. Have a good day.